A cube has a well-defined volume. If you cut it up into smaller cubes, each piece will also have its own well-defined volume that will add up to the original value of the whole thing. But what about if we cut the cube up into an infinite number of points and try to compute the volume this way? Each point has a volume of zero, but there are an infinite number of them, so the total volume suddenly becomes indeterminate. Perhaps this problem disappears when we go down to one dimension. Consider the interval of length one. You can use this simple equation to map every single point on this interval to a point on the interval that has a length of two. Now a different problem arises. Two line segments of different lengths can still have the same number of points. Or put another way, you can disassemble the unit interval into an uncountable number of points and rearrange them to form an interval twice as long. If you saw one of my previous videos on the bonnach tarski paradox, no doubt this will remind you about how a ball with a fixed volume can be broken apart and rearranged to form two copies of the original ball. All of these examples highlight what the famous mathematician Terence Tao calls the problem of measure. That is, the problem of defining a mathematical theory that can clearly and rigorously assign a volume or measure to every mathematical subset in any arbitrary dimension. The solution to this problem lies in realizing that not all subsets can be assigned a measure, but only those subsets that lie in something called a sigma algebra. A sigma algebra is the key definition underlying all of measure theory. And by the end of this video, not only will you understand exactly what it is, but you'll understand what all these other terms mean as well. Let's begin with an abstract set X. The power set of X is the collection of all possible subsets of X. And since the empty set is a subset of any set, and X is a subset of itself, the power set of X will always contain at least these two subsets. In general, it can contain a lot more. For example, if X was the set that contained the numbers 1 and 2, then the power set of X would be these four subsets. If it had three elements, it would contain eight subsets. As you can see, the size or cardinality of the power set grows very quickly as the size of the original set increases. In fact, if X is the set of all natural numbers, then its power set would be an uncountably infinite set that is isomorphic to the set of real numbers. So now that we have an abstract set X and understand what a power set is, we are in a position to define a sigma algebra. In order to form a sigma algebra, we need to gather a non-empty collection of subsets of the power set. This could be a proper subset, or it could even be the entire power set. We'll call this collection M, and it must satisfy the following two criteria. It is closed under complements. That is, if a set E is in the collection M, then its complement is also in M. Second, it is closed under countable unions. This means that for any collection of sets that are in M, the union of all of them must also be in M. This union can be a finite union or a countably infinite union. In either case, the union will remain in M. So that's it. Any collection that is a subset of the power set of X that satisfies these two criteria will be a sigma algebra. Before proceeding further, I'd like to point out two direct consequences of this definition. First, since the collection M is non-empty, this means that there's some set E that is a subset of X that is in the collection. But since M is closed under complements, then the complement of E must also be in M. But E together with its complement is just the entire set X. So X must also be in M. Secondly, since we now know that X is in M and M is closed under complements, then the complement of X or the empty set is also in M. This holds for all sigma algebras, so any sigma algebra that you might find out in the wild will always contain the entire set X as well as the empty set. And just this small collection is actually already an example of a sigma algebra. Another example is the entire power set. You can easily check that both of these satisfy the two criteria we just defined. And in the case of the two element set, these are the only two sigma algebras you can form. So whenever we have a sigma algebra, any subset that belongs to it will be called a measurable set. If a subset happens to be part of the power set, but is not in the sigma algebra, then it is called non-measurable. But wait, didn't I just say that the power set itself formed a sigma algebra? Doesn't that mean that all subsets in the power set are part of a sigma algebra and are thus measurable? Well, yes, but only with respect to the power set sigma algebra. 
With respect to other sigma algebras, this may not be the case. Whenever a set is determined to be measurable or not, it is always with respect to a certain sigma algebra. A simple way to illustrate this is if we consider the set of three elements. The power set indeed forms a sigma algebra, but there are four other sigma algebras you can form. If we just focus on one of these collections, then with respect to this sigma algebra, the empty set, the entire set, the set 2, 3, and the set 1 will all be measurable sets. However, the set 2, the set 3, along with the sets 1, 2, and 1, 3 are not in the sigma algebra and are consequently non-measurable. You can apply similar reasoning to conclude which are the measurable and non-measurable sets in the case of the other possible sigma algebras as well. Okay, so now that we understand what a sigma algebra is, we can move on to the concept of a measure. Here, we'll assume that we have some abstract set X and some sigma algebra M that has already been defined on it. Then the pair of these items together are called a measurable space, which is slightly different than a measure space. I'll explain why shortly. And recall, we've already talked about how sets in the sigma algebra are measurable sets, but now we are working on defining what a measure is. So yes, the terminology can be quite confusing. We have measure spaces, measurable spaces, measurable sets, and measures. Don't worry though, I'll help you sort through it all. So we have a measurable space that consists of the set X along with some sigma algebra M. And now we will consider special maps that are defined on M. We will denote these maps by the letter mu, and specifically we will consider maps that take subsets in M as inputs and maps them to non-negative real numbers. The reason we want the output to be non-negative real numbers is because we are trying to assign some generalized notion of volume to each of these subsets. And it won't make any sense to have a negative volume, but we will allow a volume to be zero, a positive number, or to be infinity. So if these maps satisfy the following two criteria, then they will be called a measure. First, it must map the empty set to zero. Naturally, we want the empty set to have measure zero. Second, if you take a countably infinite sequence of disjoint sets in the sigma algebra and first take their union, followed by applying mu to it, this must equal the same thing as if you applied mu to each of these sets and then took the sum. This property is called countable additivity and it implies finite additivity, which means you can do the same thing if the sequence is finite instead of countably infinite. And if the map mu satisfies both of these criteria, then we call it a measure. So by beginning with an abstract set X and equipping it with some sigma algebra M, we form a measurable space. The sets that live in M are measurable sets. If you then define a measure mu on the measurable space, then the triplet is called a measure space. To let all this sink in, we will now look at a simple example, the Dirac measure. Suppose you have a set X with its power set sigma algebra, which we'll call M. Then the pair XM form a measurable space. Now, fix some element in x, which we'll label with little x. Then we can turn this measurable space into a measure space by defining the following measure on it. For any subset s in m, then mu of s equals 1 if x is in s, and mu of s equals 0 if x is not in s. Typically, the notation that is used for this measure is to call it delta sub x, to indicate that x was the point that was fixed. To understand this measure even more clearly, let's return to the set of three elements. Its power set is all of these sets. So if we pick the element 2, then delta sub 2 would assign a measure to all the sets in the power set. The sets that contain 2 will be assigned a measure of 1, and all the other sets will be assigned a measure of 0. Although the Dirac measure seems fairly simple, it is commonly used in probability theory and it gives rise to the Dirac delta function, which is ubiquitous in physics. Interestingly, though the Dirac measure is named after the physicist Paul Dirac, it was only years after he introduced his delta function that mathematicians were able to develop this rigorous notion of the Dirac measure. 